Hello Booktube. Well, it was bright and sunny this morning after five days of rain, five solid days of rain, or five days where at least rain was couldn't be ruled out, where the, the clouds were thick, there were rumbles of thunder in the distance, and you weren't sure if the sky wasn't going to open up. After five days of that here in Boston, this morning it was bright and sunny, uh, and felt had that wonderful feeling uh, many, many of my years. I did not think it was a wonderful feeling. Now I love it. <laughs> now it's a great feeling. That wonderful feeling in the early morning air that the day is going to be warm. Uh, the early morning had that, and I was walking my little schnauzer, Frida, and she was uh, largely indifferent. She doesn't really like early mornings at all. And when we got back, I decided to go to the Brattle Bookshop take advantage of all that, all those factors together, and go to the Brattle Bookshop, which is, a, for those of you who are new to the channel, there are quite a few of you who are new. We are approaching our next double zero landmark on this channel. Uh, it's a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston, and it's fantastic. Just fantastic. Full, full of uh, stock turnover. So that you're, you're never sure what you're going to find there from day to day, much less from week to week. It's not like most used bookstores that I've been to, where you when I was when I was a dirt poor student or whatever, I would be I would be scanning the shelves of a used bookstore somewhere in Austin or in Iowa City, and I would see a book on the shelf, and I think, boy, I really want that, but I don't have the pocket money for it. I wonder if I will next week. And in between then and the the, the same period next week, I would go back a couple of times just to look at it. And that doesn't happen at the Brown <laughs> and or you can't guarantee that it will. There might be some books that do that, but. The overturn is so great at the Brattle that you don't have the luxury of doing that. You just grab what you have. And the Brattle makes that easy because they have bargain sale lots next door to the store itself where the books are $1, $3, and $5. And that's that's pretty affordable. Even at the beginning when the Brattle reopened after the pandemic, all the books out there were $5. That was still extremely affordable. Uh, but now even more so. So I, I, well, I put on pants and I went. I went to the Brattle and I found a bunch of books. And I want to show them to you. <laughs> uh, and we'll start with uh, a great deal of fiction. I've got a great deal of fiction this time around. In fact, I don't think there's much in the way of nonfiction. Uh, and the the first batch of novels that I'll show you are all relatively contemporary. And the first one I didn't get at the Brattle <laughs> at all. I'm adding it in here because I got it at one of those little free libraries that people will put outside their houses. I was on a dog walk last night, and. We came, Frida and I came across one of those, and I found this thing, and it's the only book in the series that I don't have. And I've thought about that a lot, and it's it's an excoriated book in the series for a lot of easily picked out reasons. I thought, oh, you know, it's free. It's a mass market, but it's free, So, and it's Feast for Crows. It's uh, The Despised, uh, what is this, the fourth? Uh, yeah, the fourth, The Despised fourth novel in uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, that I've only read once, and the one time that I read it, I understood immediately why it was despised. It, it feels very much like an extended middle finger to Martin's duty to finish this series and to finish the storylines of the main characters. Uh, and I, maybe that's the reason, deep down inside, I don't care about this series enough so that I think that was a motivating factor, but maybe deep down inside that was maybe the reason why I wasn't why I wasn't getting this, why I didn't get this, or maybe it was that the first three volumes of this series, when they originally appeared in mass market paperback and in trade paperback in U.S. bookstores, had beautiful cover art. And it was the fourth book in the series that that stopped. And maybe that's what threw me off. One way or another, I, I saw immediately in that little free library they didn't have it, so I grabbed it. Uh, so that's, it's still contemporary fiction, it's just fantasy. And uh, then we have a piece of contemporary fiction that needs no introduction from me. This is the only volume of this author's work that I did not have uh, in hardcover. I've had trade paperbacks of it, I've had mass market paperbacks of it, and I've always given them away. Uh, because I always praise this thing and praise this author. And so when I found the hardcover, I naturally grabbed it. This is Science of the Lamps by Thomas Harris, uh, which the reason why I've given away so many copies of this book in so many different formats is because of sheer irritation. Because I, people will say to me, what's a good, a really good piece of contemporary fiction that you can recommend? And I'll say, well, I could give you a long, long list. One of the things that would be on it would be the Science of the Lamps. And everybody, when I say that, says, oh, I've seen the movie. Oh, I've seen the movie. That has always irritated me, that book people, when you recommend something that was made into a famous movie, will be the first ones to say, I've seen the movie, when they're also the first ones to say, oh, the book was so much better. Well, you can't have it both ways. Either that's a response to saying you should read The Science of the Lambs, or it's not. 
Uh, but one way or another, as soon as I saw this at the Brattle, I realized that I don't have this. I have Hannibal Rising, I have Hannibal, and I have Red Dragon, but I didn't have this in hardcover, so now I do, and that's great. And I, all the way back here from the Brattle, I was telling myself the usual thing <laughs> that I always say when I encounter any of this author's books, except maybe Black Sunday. What I always say in the aftermath, in the trip back to wherever I'm stationed, uh, is that I will not reread it. I have, I have it. It will be there when I want to reread it, but I won't just compulsively reread it right now. And every time I fail, so I will be rereading this this weekend. I'm just going to give in and admit to that. Uh, and then these next three are very much contemporary fiction. These are probably in the 2000s. They're probably 21st century stuff. I certainly don't recognize them. Yeah, these are 2010. I believe these might be uh, UK. I think I would remember them if they had been in American bookstores. Uh, and I think they're set in, in England, so probably they are UK publications. Uh, these are by uh, James Lear. And they are murder mysteries of a decidedly gay bent. <laughs> this is A Sticky End. It's a Mitch Mitchell murder mystery. This is Palace of Varieties. <laughs> you can sense a theme here. And this is The Back Passage. Get your minds out of the gutter. <laughs> and these are, well, let, let's read a bit. Uh, Best friends and sometimes lovers, Edward Mitch Mitchell and Harry Boy Morgan, have been in terrible trouble before. Their adventures of murder, mystery, and unstoppable sex uh, have made the back passage and the secret tunnel. Now, see, I don't have the secret tunnel. I have the back passage, but I don't have that one. I mean, this is a long series. These are probably the three that somebody made a trip, you know, just flew over, landed in Boston, read them on the way over, and dumped them. Uh, that... Let's see here. The international bestsellers, The Back Passage and The Secret Tunnel, have been international bestsellers. In a sticky end, Mitch must face the possibility that his best chum is involved in a chain of events that led to the suicide of Boy's own colleague and secret paramour, Frank Bartlett. To absolve Boy, Mitch races around London finding clues while betting the many men eager to lend a hand or more. <laughs> so he's betting his sources of so so I have three of these and now it's my life's goal to have them all. I don't know how many there are. I haven't researched this author. I just plopped on to make this video right away. But I, I haven't read these. They could be absolutely awful. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them this weekend. I'll probably read just one unless I really like them. In which case I'll read them all and pine for the volumes that I don't have. This author is new to me. For all I know, he's written lots of other stuff in addition to murder mysteries. So I'm hoping that I like him. Always up for a new, for a new author. And then we have... Uh, then these next three books are also fiction. They're not contemporary fiction, though. They're vintage fiction of a certain kind and boy, oh boy, of a certain type. <laughs> this is uh, sudsy historical fiction. Somebody must have had a whole library of these things and just got rid of them. The first one is The Voyagers by Dale Van Every. And that is the cover. Uh, the great old uh, 1970s cover art. Is that what this is? 1970s? Oh, 19, well, 1957, but this volume was 1971, so it is, God knows what it looked like in 1957. Dale Van Every did a whole bunch of historical no, uh, fiction like this. But they all star, this one stars Abel Trainer, a giant young adventurer who uh, shoots and fights and beds his way across all of uh, America in 1788, all of the frontier. Uh, and I've read a lot, I think I've read everything by this author, but I've read a lot of his, of his historical fiction and liked it. Uh, he's, nevertheless, uh, the, my favorite thing by him, predictably enough, is nonfiction. It's a book called Disinherited. It's nonfiction about the American government's relationship with the Indian nations that it uh, conquered and swindled and impoverished and then penned up in reservations over the course of a century. And I, I don't know why Disinherited is not better known. People know Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. They know Custer Died for Your Sins. But they don't know that book. And that book is just written in such a rage. It's such an amazing work. Uh, I don't think I have a copy of Disinherited at the moment, but it's well worth your time to find if you see it at a used bookstore. And his his historical fiction is also very, very good. Uh, he, he managed to do both fairly well. Uh, and then this next one is not the colon it's not colonial America. It's Civil War America. This is David Devine's Thunder on the Chesapeake, <laughs> in which there you have the the monitor and the. Uh, the, the, the ironclads fighting their very first battle and uh, 
this is, uh, I read this novel when it first, uh, not when it first came out, but I have read this before. This came out in 1961. Doesn't look like it was ever reprinted. Maybe I did read it then. <laughs> but I, I remember it, that it, it's a, a fairly standard story, a virtuous young woman who falls in love. She's basically in love with two young men, and you can see this coming. You can write the next part yourself. One of them joins the Confederacy, and one of them fights for the Union. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens, and a whole bunch of larding. These, these uh, historical novels of a certain period were always big and fat. The, the Dale Van Every is, is an exception. The, they're always big and fat. And one of the most famous ones uh, of the time uh, we're going to get to. One of the most famous ones of these, probably the reason that flushed all of these things into quick print and kept them in print, that developed an audience for them, was a big historical novel called Drums Along the Mohawk. Uh, that was, it was big, it was resplendent, and it, it shored up an industry for a long time. I'm kind of surprised that I didn't see Drums Along the Mohawk today, because these books obviously came from the same person. And no person who has these books would would not have drums along the Mohawk. Maybe they kept it. Maybe they're still alive. Uh, and this next one is a World War, uh, uh, American Revolution novel uh, called The Perilous Night uh, by Burke Boyce. Another big, fat, vintage historical novel uh, that has a very telling blurb. Uh, the Saturday Review, which was once great for reviewing books. Absolutely fantastic. I don't know if the Saturday Review is even still around. What I wouldn't give to write for them. Boy, oh boy. Uh, the, their, their blurb is uh, a book rich with drama, poignance, and passion. This book is the most interesting novel of the American Revolution since James Fenimore Cooper's novel, The Spy. And there's a reason for that, and it's not, much as I love Cooper, it's not that The Spy is all that good. It's that for some odd reason the American Revolution has not produced any great novels. <sighs> Maddening to me, the closest that we get is Patriots by Languth, which is nonfiction. It's just very novelistic nonfiction. But this thing is the story of the American Revolution coming to the Hudson Valley, and it's, uh, this came, was originally published in 1942, and this edition is from, again, from the 1970s. I imagine all of these things are, I imagine that whoever had these things, smells like they were in an attic for a great deal of time, whoever had these things probably just got them all in the 70s. Uh, and then this next one looks like the same thing. It's not, though. It's close. It was marketed to look the same thing and maybe to fool a harried commuter on his way from Scarsdale to the city. Uh, this is The Musket and the Cross, and it's by Walter Edmonds, who is the author of Drums Along the Mohawk. Uh, and this is a, the Francis Parkman territory. This is a story of the French and, and English fighting in North America and the eventual defeat of the French and all of the major battles and all the major players. It's a great big fat thing. This probably, I'm going to guess, that this edition is also from the 70s. Uh, the book came out in 1968. Uh, well, that's close enough. <laughs> that's close enough. Uh, and the thing that sets it apart, the reason that this isn't quite like the other three, is because this is nonfiction. This is actual history. It was just dressed up to look like this kind of thing. It looks virtually indistinguishable from from this kind of thing. And it was designed for cross, uh, you know, cross genre appeal. Uh, and these things are hit or miss. I, I don't remember particularly liking Drums Along the Mohawk, but I, my, I admit, my I antip anticipation at the Brattle Sale Cards was up for finding a copy, because I haven't read Drums Along the Mohawk in quite some time. It might be that I would like it a lot more. I will certainly read this again. I read this originally, but I think I read it with a great din of prejudice in my ears, because I'm very, very fond of Francis Parkman. Uh, but I should, I should read this again, and it's only going to, these, these paperbacks are only going to last for one reading. I'm not going to bother to reinforce them. Uh, and th something like this, these are hit or miss. Uh, I said, that, like for instance, Bruce Boyce, this, The Perilous Night is not a great American Revolution novel, and that neither is The Spy, and neither are the handful of others that even rise to the level. I mean, what have you got? Johnny Tremaine? April Morning by Howard Fast? They, they typically aren't very good. They don't, they don't cover the whole of the war, and they don't cover it in any kind of literary, go kind of, you know, literary heft. I don't remember this being stand out at all, but I'll give it a try and uh, another try. It's been a long, long time since I read it and see if maybe it does. This author certainly has credit with me uh, because he's the author of The Man from Mount Vernon, which is very close to a revolutionary era great novel. This is a, a, a terrific novel about George Washington. Just terrific. Uh, I didn't see it at the Brattle today. This is not from my Brattle Hall. I just, as soon as I got back here, I was thinking, Burke Boyce, I know that name, and I went and found this, because I will reinforce the cover on this and give it a reread, absolutely. Especially since I'm sure that this Perilous Night will make me want to. 
Uh, and then this next one is contemporary historical fiction, also from the Revolutionary period, and boy oh boy is it good. I was so happy to see, as soon as I saw the copy I realized that I would long since got rid of my own. This originally came out uh, in 2004. And boy, oh boy, is it good. <laughs> well worth your time to read. And again, a fantastic fictional, fictional evocation of George Washington, who's usually very poorly served in historical fiction. And this is Washington and Caesar, an inspired idea for a novel. This is by uh, Christian Cameron, who is an extreme veteran of historical fiction. I should have known that. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't, know who he was. I didn't recognize the name at all when I read this book. I should have recognized that I was in the hands of a practice master because that this, the book is so good. And it has the prize, prize plot device of telling the story of the years up to the American Revolution and then the American Revolution through two different viewpoints, Washington and a slave named Caesar. And boy, oh boy, is it good. Both parts are great. Can't, can't wait to reread this. This is, this is I'm, I should be rereading this first before I do my 100 millionth reread of Signs of the Lambs, but there's time enough for all of this stuff. I'm not, there's time enough for all of it, and this time I'll keep this, because it's uh, well worth keeping. But we'll finish out with some nonfiction, because you, you might be wondering who this is, and what have they done with Steve Donahue if I'm reading all this fiction, but I did buy some nonfiction as well. One of them is something from, this is from eons ago, when was this, the 1950s? 1947. Uh, and I don't think I've ever read it. I will, I will know right away. I'll, I'll know by the first chapter if I've ever read it, but I couldn't pass it up. I have a whole shelf of books like this. This is by A.C. Lyons, and it is Invitation to Boston. A Merry Guide to Her Past, Present, and Future. And the, look at that. There's Granary Burial Ground uh, on Park Street. Uh, huh. uh, there's Inside King's Chapel. Uh, I'll be visiting a burial ground in Boston just this weekend. Uh, there's the Paul Revere statue. Uh, it'll, be it'll be fascinating to see what counts as her future in this book because it will all be the past. In between when this book was written and now, Boston has gone through major epochs. A whole uh, physical facelift has happened since then. A massive civil engineering face facelift First, an elevated highway was put in to the city, just f burrowed right through a living neighborhood. Then it lasted for a long time as an incredible eyesore. And then that whole thing was pulled down in a project that was called the Big Dig. Epic thing, just epic. Because the city planners in Boston looked at that elevated highway and the problems that it was creating and realized, well, we've got all the figures for census and travel and highway data and federal figures and everything, we know perfectly well that in very little time this eyesore of an elevated highway is going to be outdated anyway in terms of usage. We're going to have to tear it down eventually anyway, or it's going to bottleneck so bad that it's going to kill the city. It's going to kill the commerce in the city. Obviously we don't want that, so we need to plan ahead and what we're going to do is proactively pull this thing down now. Long since overdue, of course you can't bring back the neighborhood that was destroyed, but nevertheless, uh, that all lies in the future of this book. So that's going to be fascinating to read. There'll be another one where, like uh, Man from Mount Vernon, I will reinforce the cover and then probably read it <laughs> this week. I'll probably do it when I should be reading new stuff. I'll probably read a lot of this stuff. And then this next one, the last one that we'll do here, is another nonfiction. This is a big collection. I don't know that this came out in America. I don't remember it. Uh, but it is edited by Frank Jackson. And it is Faithful Friends, a gigantic anthology of dogs in literature and dogs in history. So, so diary entries, journal entries, that historical accounts. It's not just literature, it's not just poetry and novels and whatnot. It's everything. And boy, oh boy, does it. I remember bits and pieces of it. I, I don't think I've ever owned it. But I, I remember that it's really complete, probably the most complete dog anthology that I've ever, that I've ever known about. Although I could be missing some really big ones. I d tend not to like these things as much as you might think I would. Uh, and this has an, a forward by Prince Michael of Kent, who is a first cousin to Queen Elizabeth II. He is the younger brother of the Duke of Kent. Uh, he's famous for having an, an enormous uh, beard, <laughs> and and he's also the patron. He's the patron of a million charities. I guess he's famous now because he's, he and his wife have had some scandals, minor scandals attached to their name, uh, in the last decade or two. But uh, 
he, like most of the royals, he, he attaches his name to lots and lots of charities, and one of them is a kennel association. So he was tapped, as the saying goes, to write a forward for this book. And uh, if memory serves, <laughs> yeah, he did not tax himself. <laughs> two paragraphs, and they're skimpy paragraphs, too. He didn't, you'd think he would farm it out to a secretary, get a couple of pages in there, and then just look it over. But no, <laughs> I guess he's too busy. And this is broken down by uh, all the different categories. So dogs as heroes, dogs as help meets, meeting young puppies, dogs in prose, dogs in verse. And there's also a very touching chapter of dogs leaving, leaving their owners. Uh, farewell to dogs. Uh, that is, uh, it's quite good. I feel, I feel behooved to read you something. This is uh, from Lord Byron. Uh, in case you didn't know this verse, it's rather famous, or at least it was back when people read poetry that wasn't. Red tricycle, red tricycle, avert! Thank you, thank you. I'll take my Pulitzer now. <laughs> uh, when some proud son of man returns to earth, unknown to glory, but upheld by birth, the sculptor's art exhausts the pomp of woe, and storied urns record who rests below. When all is done, upon the tomb is seen not what he was, but what he should have been. But the poor dog, in life the firmest friend, the first to welcome, foremost to defend, whose honor, honest heart is still his master's own, who labors, fights, lives, breathes for him alone. Unhonored falls, unnoticed all his worth, denied in heaven the soul he held on earth, while man, vain insect, hopes to be forgiven and claims himself a soul exclusive heaven. O man, thou feeble tenant of an hour, debased by slavery or corrupt by power, who knows thee well must quit thee with disgust, degraded mass of animated dust. Thy love is lust, thy friendship all a cheat, thy smiles hypocrisy, thy words deceit. By nature vile, ennobled, but by name, each kindred brute must bid thee blush for shame. Ye who perchance behold this simple urn, pass on, it honors none you wish to mourn. To mark a friend's remains these stones arise, I never knew but one. And here he lies. And that was to a, a dog. <laughs> that was one of the loveliest things Byron ever wrote. He wrote it to a dog. <laughs> uh, so that was a, a, a piece of nonfiction that I will, of course, be picking through. I think I can probably have the strength of will to resist going at this thing. Otherwise, all of my reading for the next two days is going to be the stuff I got today at the Brattle, and I'd rather not that be true. Uh, but anyway, that's a Brattle Hall for you. There's Faithful Friends, a collection of dog writing, fantastic. We have Invitation to Boston, a Boston book, an old Boston book that I don't think I've ever read. We have Washington and Caesar, a historical novel that captures a lot of tricky stuff to capture in, in revolutionary era fiction. Uh, then we have, Revo uh, we have uh, The Musket and the Cross, some uh, colonial era nonfiction, a history of the, French and, of the French and English wars in America. We have uh, The Perilous Night, a, a novel uh, about the American Revolution in the Hudson Valley. We have The Voyagers by Dale Van Every, one of his sudsy adventure uh, historical novels, uh, also in the colonial era. Then we have Thunder on the Chesapeake, uh, historical fiction, but I couldn't pass it up. Uh, we have the Mitch Mitchell Mysteries <laughs> of uh, James Lear. The Mitch Mitchell Mysteries. No idea what they will be like. I'm hoping that I will enjoy them, but you never know. <laughs> we have The Science of the Lambs, of course, by Thomas Harris. No no need for an introduction there. Uh, and also, uh, off the beaten track of the Brattle, we have Feast for Crows by George R. R. Martin. To, to sort of finish out my George R. R. Martin collection, although I'm not all that, like I said, I'm not all that in love with the series, so, you know, I wanted a copy of Feast of Crows and it was literally free. Uh, but if, I, if, if down the line I were to find, for instance, a trade paperback that was pretty, this is not pretty, this is kind of boring. If I were to find something that was more eye-catching and that was a trade paperback, I'd probably take that as well. Uh, but anyway, there you go. That was a, a, a Brattle and Beyond mail haul for a, for a nice, bright, warm Thursday. I don't know when I'll be back to the Brattle. I'm going to try to restrain myself. <laughs> but I, if I don't, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.